Today we're going to discuss the case of Darlene Hulse. This is an unsolved murder case and I will forewarn you it gets a little bit graphic. It's not too bad though. But Darlene was born on October 15th, 1955 in Gary, Indiana. She met her husband Ron Hulse at church. They ended up getting married on June 22nd, 1974. Darlene was a smart cookie. She finished a four-year program in medical technology. In 1978, the two of them moved to Argos, Indiana. I think I said that right. But they moved to Indiana and she decided to be a stay-at-home mother and Ron went to work at the Young Door Company in Plymouth, Indiana, which was near Argos. Darlene led a quiet little life and that's the way she liked it. She really only socialized with her with both of their family and her church friends. Darlene and Ron had three little girls. Marie was eight years old at this time. Melissa was six years old and Kristen was just a few days before her first birthday. And this was on August 17th, 1984 when the murder occurred. Now at 5 a.m., Ron went off to work like he did every morning. Um, around 9 a.m., her father showed up on his bike to bring them bananas and to say hi. They didn't, him and his wife, her parents, didn't live too far from her. Right after he left, she asked Marie and Melissa to get into the bathtub because they had errands to run that day. So the two little girls did what they were told and they got into the bathtub. Not long at all after they got into the bathtub, Marie heard a knock at the door and a man telling her mother that he had a delivery. The next thing she heard was some weird grunting noises and it sounded like a growl. And at the time, their family dog was at the vet being bred. And so she thought her dad came home early from work to bring them a new puppy or to bring them their dog back home. So she was excited and she got out of the bathtub and ran into the living room. This is when Marie saw what I am guessing is probably the most traumatizing thing that she's ever had to see. And it's something I wouldn't wish on anybody. But she walked in to a man fighting her mom. Her mother was on the ground. They were in the doorway and they were struggling. So Marie, scared, ran to the phone. Now, this was before 911 and Marie only knew two numbers. So she tried to call her aunt, but the signal was busy. The stranger started dragging her mother across the living room by her hair to get to where Marie was to rip the phone out of the wall and Darlene was screaming at Marie to run so Marie ran into the bathroom to tell Melissa to run and Marie ran out the back door to run to her grandparents house not long after Melissa followed her so of course Darlene's parents called nine or called the police. Now this all happened in such a short time that the police were there within 15 minutes and it was only 945 and remember her father had stopped by around nine o'clock. Now when the police got there Darlene was nowhere to be seen but there was a trail of blood from the doorway to where we can all assume the attacker's car was parked. and. The worst part, there was a fire poker covered in blood. There was blood all over the carpet, but the worst part was baby Kristen was in the middle of the living room covered in her mother's blood. Now, she wasn't injured or harmed at all, but she was covered in her mother's blood, which is just so sad. Melissa and Marie helped with sketches of the attacker. He was a white male between the ages of 20 to 30. He was in his 20s or 30s. He was six foot tall to six foot two inches tall. He weighed about 145 to 150 pounds. 
and he had long blonde hair and there was possibly black streaks in his hair. He was wearing a dark tan shirt with stripes. He had on grayish brown corduroy pants with no belt and he had on tan leather boots, leather working boots. His car was a greenish blue. It was a General Ford or a General Motors car and it was made between 1970 and 1974. It was in crap condition because it had rust on the bottom of both sides and on the top of the car it had what looked it was painted and it looked like it was hand painted. Now, for the record, the kids obviously couldn't describe all that for the car, though they did describe a little bit, but a neighbor drove past the attacker as he was leaving the home heading west. So he got a glimpse of the attacker as well as the car. Of course, at the time, he didn't know what was happening, but he was a great witness to help out on the case. Immediately, the police called a search for Darlene and her attacker. Um, the FBI from South Bend, Indiana even came down to help. But unfortunately, her deceased body was found the very next day. And the wooded area where her body was found was about six miles from her home. And it was under an old broken fence. A uh, lumber buyer or timber buyer came across her body he had been marking trees that he wanted to purchase. Darlene was fully clothed and she didn't seem to be sexually assaulted and the autopsy confirmed that. She had died from blunt trauma to her head by the fire poker. She had been hit seven times. On August 23rd, there was a sighting in Fulton County of a hitchhiker that resembled the sketches of the attacker. So when the police went to talk to him, this man took off right away. He took off running into a cornfield and they were unable to find him. The first big lead was a man named Danny Bender. He was in Colorado, but he was transferred back to Indiana or transported back. Um, the rumor has it that he knew who killed Darlene, but honestly, I. The information was a bit fuzzy on what he had to do with the case, if anything at all, but he was released. On October 10th, there was another big lead. There was a man by the name of Robert Zabrowski. He had left town right after Darlene's death. Um, before he had lived in Plymouth, he had worked for a carnival, and right after her death, he went he rejoined the carnival and he was found in Alabama and they transported him back to Indiana for questioning. They took saliva samples, his fingerprints, blood samples and everything else but his blood didn't match the blood that was on the carpet which I forgot to mention. Most of the blood at the scene of the crime was Darlene's but there was some of the attacker's blood but anyway his DNA didn't match the blood on the carpet so he was released. The last big lead in Darlene's case was a man named Richard Mock. Now Richard had been suspected of several robberies and burglaries and theft throughout Illinois and in, and in Indiana. On October 25th, Richard Mock was in Amarillo, Texas. He was in the middle of a robbery and the police came so it ended in a high speed chase. At some point, he shot at the police officer and missed, and the police officer shot back and ended up striking Richard and killing him. The reason they thought he was a suspect was because he resembled the sketch, and his car really resembled the car that was seen. After he was deceased, the Argos police received his fingerprints and a sample of his DNA, but his, his DNA didn't exclude him from the blood that was on the carpet. However, the blood that was on the carpet and his DNA had very few markers in common. The other issue was that his car was impounded at the time of Darlene's death. But the weird thing was when they went to search his apartment, 
they did find a clipping from a newspaper about Darlene's death which make police believe that maybe he knew somebody that had committed the crime. Now that was the last big lead that the police have spoken about and that was quite a bit ago, obviously. It was all in 1984. There have been several theories about who did it. Some people believe that her husband hired somebody and that's why the dog was conveniently not there during her murder. But there's zero evidence to support that and it just doesn't seem like he was the one who did it. The biggest theory about why it happened is that, and this is the theory that the police believe, is that the, the attacker was trying to sexually assault Darlene. But she fought back and it got out of hand and he accidentally killed her. Um, that's why they think he took the body because he thought she was still alive, but she was passed away. Um, they also believe that's why he didn't hurt any of her children at all. This investigation, despite being so old, is still active. Um, Darlene's daughters deserve justice. They deserve to know who hurt, hurt their mother and why. They deserve this. If you know anything about this, please call the Michiana Crime Stoppers, which is the Crime Stoppers for Michigan and Indiana. The number is 1-800-342-STOP. I will have the number obviously on the screen, but it'll also be listed below in the description box. And until next time.